Welcome back, everyone, to this week's episode of the podcast. Our guest this week is Matthew Kark. He is my brother-in-law and good friend. He owns his own photography business, Matt Kark Photography. Um, Matt, it's a pleasure having you on the podcast. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be on here. Hopefully, we can have some fun. I oh, hope we'll so. We usually do. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I don't know. When you texted me, I was like, oh, man, I don't know what I'm going to talk about. But, you know, we'll try to make it work and we'll see what happens. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to no. try to say, keep everything respectful on here, you know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, when are you not respectful? I have never heard you not be respectful. Oh, oh I did. I always... he, was, he was very disrespectful to me at the wedding about my title. Oh. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I always try to be respectful. There's, I, I just always say I'm very passionate about certain things. It's not that I'm dramatic or like disrespectful i'm just passionate about it that's what i always say but okay anyways all right well matt you are basically i would say the first um you know started your own business on our podcast everyone so far we've had has either basically followed your traditional career route of graduated high school uh, Mm -hmm. you know chose a college found a career path that they thought they would enjoy or, you know, don't enjoy, and then <laughs> <laughs> navigated the, uh, um, you know, the career ladder to get where they're mm-hmm. at now. And so we thought it'd be, you know, I guess a good break from that and to hear from you how you started your business, um, how you found yeah. photography, or if, you know, maybe it found you. Uh, <laughs> that that would really help if photography just found you. That would be yeah, good for the it, podcast. it would it would be great if just jobs found us and then we just made it full time <laughs> living. That's that's the dream for everyone. I feel like nowadays is like oh, I just hope a job kind of finds me. But no, yeah, um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I uh, started back in what was it sophomore year of high school, and like everyone's always asking me like, oh wow, was it like some profound like vision that you had for your life that you wanted to be a photographer. And like, if you were to ask me like ninth grade year, what I want to do with my life, I probably would have told you, I have no idea. And <laughs> I was like, I'd probably just go to college and follow my siblings footsteps. And so, but sophomore year, I actually, and this is, this is so funny, but I literally opened up an Instagram account and then I fell in love with all these amazing photos. And I was like, I could go do that. And then I realized that I don't have the money for that. <laughs> all the equipment to you know and i wanted to travel the world and take photos of all these amazing places and i think that's everyone's dream but uh i Not realized much. i like needed some type of guidance and like business push and so i reached out to photographers and luckily i had this amazing mentor um tj and brooke who helped me kind of like push and they've been they ran a 15 year old uh, wedding business so they kind of knew what they were doing um okay and so they like kind of took me under the wing and said, here's how you do it. And this is what we wouldn't do, or this is what we would do for, you know, your age and where you're at in life. And so that's kind of how I got started. And then kind of went from there. That's oh, really sweet. Cool. Yeah. So like when you're, I mean, it kind of sounds like photography found you, you opened up that Instagram app and saw all those beautiful pictures. And then it was like a yeah. light came down, you know, something like that. I just, <sighs> See, this is, it's, it's more like I loved just the photos and what they could capture. And I've always been someone who like, I'll hop onto like a hobby or a skill and I just want to be like the best at it. And it kind of sounds prideful, but like, that's just like kind of who I am. And so like, I kind of hopped onto photography and I knew that I wasn't going to be like a halfway, like a, oh, Mm -hmm. let me just, you know, like take some photos and then a month later it's going to be over. And what I actually think what I started really falling in love with it, you know, and I don't want to like loosely throw out like passion or falling in love, but what I really loved is just like interacting with the people and like the business side of it. Um, and again, like running a photography business, there's not like, you know, you're not, it's not like a huge corporation with a hundred employees under you, you know, it's really just yourself. And, uh, you know, one self, uh, photographer, self employed person told me, you know, really you learn a skill levels of an HR person being, um, you know, your accountant being the person who has to make the hard decisions, you know, and so like, you kind of get a all of kind of what a business goes through, because you're the only person that is doing it. And so I actually I love certain aspects of running my own business, but I hate other aspects of it. And that's just kind of how it is. And but, you know, so I wouldn't say it was like a burning bush moment. I think it was more me just feeling like, 
I was good at it. Me feeling that like, even on the bad days, I still wanted to stick with it. And that's kind of what I went for. I loved interacting with the people and taking photos. And I loved just that part of like, you deliver that gallery and they're like, oh, wow, we thought this was going to turn out terrible, but we actually look good in them. And so that's like, that's always a fun to get like a text <laughs> or an email from people being like, wow, because, you know, people are only used to like iPhone photos, you know? Yeah. And, and so when you put a camera in front of them and you take really any photo, everyone's always stunned of what it looks like. But that's a good yeah. Point. yeah, I guess I don't really think about that. Yeah, I don't. I'm, I'm not a very good photographer. Um <laughs> So when did you when did you switch from a recreational photographer, somebody that wants to make be the best Instagram photographer out there, and switch mm-hmm. and say, hey, like I can make some money doing this? Like, I guess yeah. when was your first gig? Do they call it a gig so, in photography? <laughs> yeah, you could call it a gig. Yeah. So my photo first shoot. gig, photo shoot, I guess. And so this is the best piece of advice. Anyone who asks me how to start out with photography, what is best piece of advice I've ever had from someone for photography is just find all the prettiest people in your life and shoot photos of them for free. <laughs> and like, so I was like, okay, that's great. I had a lot of friends. And so I just started shooting photos and like your first hundred thousand photos are always going to be terrible. But the thing is you get to learn a lot about photography. And so like I was shooting and shooting and then I'm pretty sure I just had like a couple of my friends who were like, Hey, can you shoot senior photos? And I was like, sure. And they're like, we could pay you like 50 bucks and like 50 bucks to a sophomore who would like, is used to making 50 bucks in one day because it's a high school job. I was like, Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. And so I think my first gig literally was a senior photo shoot. And like, I'm sure if I look back at the gallery now, I was like, this is terrible. What was I doing? Um, (laughs) But like, I just remember the client being like, wow, these are amazing. And so like a lot of my first gigs were just me shooting like family friends for family photos or um, senior photos. And that's when it started to shift from like, more of a a hobby where I started shooting photos of my friends for free to more of like paid gigs. And that's when I started to kind of like rack up the money. And I put that in air quotes. I wasn't really making tons of money, but I was making as a sophomore in high school, I was making more money than I ever thought I could make. And I remember um, TJ, my mentor was like, yeah, you know, what are your like end of year goals? And I think he's like, yeah, what if you decided you could make $10,000 in a year? And now, you know, as a high schooler, like, whoa, $10,000 in one year, there's no way I could do that. You know, <laughs> Especially like, on, and, on weekends. That's, that's a good yeah, gig. I mean, that's And cool. so like, I was just like, and I didn't even, I kind of really just wanted to stick with portraits. And then I remember the first, my very first wedding. Um, I Were was you shaking? Was magical. Was I was, magical. no, I was stressed <laughs> as all get out. Like I, I have second shot and that's where, you know, you have a main shooter and then a second shooter. I have second shot, you know, once or twice. And that's the easiest gig ever. But like when it's your own client, I was so stressed and I just got there like 30 minutes early and I was like, okay, this is going to be great. I'm going to do a fine job. And if I ruin these photos, they're going to be so mad at me. And so I was super stressed. And I think like, you know, my, my first wedding, I'm pretty sure I charged someone like $500. And to me again, I was like, wow, that's so much money. Um, which like five hundred dollars for wedding photos is so 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 cheap. I don't know. I was if gonna say I feel like something. we're gonna have to get into that later because I don't know yeah. any, what is a realistic price for anything. Oh, geez. it depends on way too much to me. <laughs> and so that's kind of when um, it became you know like when I started shooting friends for free. You know, I always say like never be too cheap to shoot for free um, because you learn so much and and you know I'll get later on in that of just like you have more creativity when you shoot for someone who isn't a client. Um, you know. But yeah, that's kind of when it changed. Uh, and hopefully I answered that question for you a little bit. Um, yeah, oh, yeah, that's I mean, kind that's... of when it all shifted for me. And then it... life just happened. Yeah, you know, life just happens. So in the <laughs> beginning, like what did you, I guess, did you research cameras to buy or did you have one or like what, what, what equipment were we starting out with here? So I started out with my iPhone. It was okay. like literally the iPhone 4. It was I think like. that's what I have now. No, yeah, you know. it, <laughs> iPhone 4 was like that rectangular boxy shape. It was maybe as big as your palm. And then I started shooting literally on my iPhone uh, of just the most random things ever. And then I finally worked my butt off. I was a part-time barista at the time. Or was I lifeguard? One of those two. And, um, a lifeguard. and then I saved up enough money and I bought this Nikon D300 used for $300. And then I took that everywhere. And so I was using that equipment. Um, it was a crop frame, D300. 
I had a 35 millimeter lens on it. And that's like what I started out with. It was like the lowest, lowest possible equipment you could use. Um, and I was literally using my, uh, my parents' computer to edit these photos. Um, oh, really? Yeah. And I had no idea what I was doing. Like, I was just like, I don't know what to do. And so that's what I was doing. And that's what I started out with. You just kind of start out with what you have. Um, and you kind of go from there. But yeah. Wow. So I guess that goes into another point. How did you start learning basically to post edit your photos afterwards? That whole yeah. process. And so I guess kind of what I learned, what I was taught from was trial and error was my best friend. Um, I cannot tell you how many photo shoots I went on. And I thought the photos were going to be great. And when I was on my computer, I was like, these are terrible. How do I fix these? Um, and so I just learned a lot from YouTube. And I okay. learned a lot from just other photographer friends that I would text or call and say, hey, I have no idea what I'm doing here. How do you fix this? Or how do you get that? Or how do you shoot this way? Or how, you know, I'd send them a photo that they took that was really good. And I admired that. And I said, what were your settings? What did you do here to get that photo? And I started to learn from that. Um, I started to learn from kind of, you know, other people of what they did and what they didn't like or what they thought was better than this and that. And I started to realize, you know, all photographers shoot and edit differently. So you could have, you know, one, the same scenery with the same uh, uh, model in it. And you have five different photographers or shoot it five different ways and edit five different ways, you know. And so that's where I started to branch out and kind of figure out what I liked, what I didn't like, what worked for me, what didn't work for me. Um, what I felt most comfortable with. Um, and so I just reached out. I think that's the biggest thing. I started to reach out to people. Um, I wasn't afraid to just send like a really just nice text and say, Hey, I'm just starting out. Could you maybe help me? I could buy you coffee. Um, and that's what I did. I like okay, that, that's, man. Really? That's yeah, cool. Showing yeah. some gumption there, Matt. It was, uh, again, I'm a very outgoing person, but I also like, you know, I've always, I don't know, like if you want to get into a field, I feel like you really had to do your homework with it and just like see what works and doesn't work and like meet your competition or lack thereof, or, you know, you're not really their competition yet, but yeah. <laughs> you're not their competition yet. That's funny. No, like there's like some people that I'm like, oh wow, they're amazing photographers and I would never get on their level type of thing. Um, okay. But yeah. So is is editing software? I mean, is everybody using you know Photoshop? Everybody using the same thing, or do we got so, different softwares everyone's using? So at the end of the day, you have two different types of software. About ninety percent of people are going to use Lightroom, which is still part of the Adobe software. But then I actually use Photoshop. Um, you can get to the real nitty gritty part and why I use Photoshop. I was taught that I can use Lightroom, but I'm not the most comfortable because i don't know where everything is um but i also the the thing that really uh, uh bought me with photoshop is i think and this will get into very technical terms but i think that uh you lose your depth of field in lightroom when you convert from raw to jpeg um okay oh yeah which i, I don't know <laughs> forever whoever's listening this can get super nerdy but yeah that's why i think i use uh photoshop the most i think it keeps that depth of field um, which depth of field is that blurriness behind the person or blurriness of that foreground? Um, mm -hmm. And so it doesn't like take away from that. Matt, so yeah, that's, that's cool. Start talking yeah. about signal processing. I did some of that in uh, school actually with photo cleanup, but it was yeah. using Mat MATLAB to clean up photos, which was interesting. Oh, whoa. But yeah, yeah so like, you know, the industry, that. most people use Lightroom. There's pros and cons to both. It's just really what you're comfortable with, what you learn from. I think at the end of the day, it's whatever you're the most fast with because time is money. And so whatever you can produce your photos to the, to the client as fast as you can, go do that. Um, and so that's what I say. But, you know. So that brings up a question for me. What If you did like an hour-long photo shoot, how many hours mm -hmm. of editing would that be afterwards? So hour-long photo shoot, I usually say just – double that so like an hour long of just shooting usually takes about an hour of uh editing um a good photographer when they shoot the photo won't really have a lot to really touch up on in post and so like i'll shoot a photo shoot and like i i always tell people just slow down take your time understand the light kind of look at it and so 
you know, it's usually about, you know, an hour to an hour for shooting. And that would be going through all the photos, picking out the best ones, editing all of them, and then formatting them into high resolution and then sending them out. Um, for a wedding, which is like an eight hour day, you're probably looking close to like five hours if you have undistracted, very focused time um, to edit all of those. Again, a photo shoot, a senior photo shoot, I'd shoot around 700 photos. People are looking to get around 100 photos back. For a wedding, I shoot 2,500 to 3,000, and they're looking to get around about oh. like 700 photos back. Good um, you know, it, it, it really depends. Um, where you go and what you do, but kind of that's the, my, my, my common, like kind of to help you understand would be like for every, uh, you know, seven photos that I take, I try to have one of those, one of those seven be ones that I keep and send to the client, you know, same thing with, um, same thing with like weddings for every eighth photo that I shoot. I want to make sure that eight, like within those eight photos, one of those are good enough to send to a client that helps you because, you know, when you have, uh, three weddings in one weekend or two weddings in one weekend, you have, you know, 6,000 photos to go through. You don't want to go through all of those because your eyes are just going to die. Um, Good night. Yeah. And so like, I always say shoot for quality, not quantity. Some people are afraid and just shoot 12,000 photos in one wedding. And oh. the only, you know, they give like, Oh, not 12,000. That's crazy. Say 6,000 and what, you know, one okay. wedding. That's Oh um, yeah. That's not crazy. <laughs> You know, and so, but like what happens is like, they'll still send the same amount of photos that I send to my client. Um, but what really hurts them is that time because they have to do double the, fo- double the amount of time they have to go through those photos, you know? And so again, it just starts to come down to time and how fast you can uh, uh, have a turnaround time. But yeah. So guess, what it, to me, no, it sounds ahead, like Cole. you're saying, it sounds like you're saying that if you put in more effort and take a little bit more time while you're taking the photos. It, it <laughs> greatly reduces the amount of yeah. time you, you have to edit them. And that, that seems like fun yeah. to me because taking yeah. photos, I could get behind editing them. I don't, I don't think I would ever enjoy that. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's where I would, again, would start to define a good photographer, someone who is okay with like first thinking, Oh wow, this is a really good spot. And then stopping and saying, you take, take a couple photos and they realize this is a terrible spot. But instead of admitting that they were wrong, they might shoot 30 photos and then go to the next place. Um, for me, I will shoot like two or three photos. Look at them like, wow, this is a terrible place. Let's go to the next place that I had in mind to go shoot. Because then, you know, I'm not going through 50 or, you know, 80 photos of a really bad location that I knew that I wasn't really going to use for the sake of me not looking like I knew what I was doing. Because, you know, mm. not every photographer is going to get it on the first time. You know, not every photographer where they point oh, let's go shoot over there, you know, on your wedding day is going to be the perfect spot, you know. Um, they just some, you know, some photographers won't tell you. They'll just shoot a couple of photos and be like, all right, all right, we're done here. Let's go to the next place. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you, you learn to just kind of dodge uh, and, you know, roll off your uh, mistakes pretty quickly um, for the sake of the client so you don't look as bad like you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> so I guess yeah. how, how do you know – like when you reach that next level, like from you're like, oh, you're doing some high school photos, you do a couple mm-hmm. weddings, and then you're like, all right, I, I've reached a next level, I can start yeah. charging more money. I I think you get to a point where it's all about experience. Um, it truly isn't about equipment. It's not about how well you run your business or who you've shot, but I think it really truly comes down to experience. I'm entering into my fourth wedding season um, and uh, you know, I'm charging, what is it? A 30, 3,200 for eight hours uh, coverage okay. per wedding, you know? And so, so that, that's secondary or just you. Yeah. Me and the second shooter. So, you know, then you pay the second shooter. So, you know, um, but uh, I would say, you know, when you know, you kind of made it and I put that in air quotes is uh, <laughs> I think, where you can make it a full-time gig, but you have a set amount of weddings that you want to shoot a year. Um, my kind of goal is transitioning into this fourth year, kind of transitioning into this uh, fifth year and whatnot, um, is to say, okay, I want to only shoot 30 weddings. I only want to shoot 40 weddings at a set amount of price that I know that I can live off of. Um, mm, and that's kind of like where saying. you want to be at. And so like you start, you want to like in your head start to think, okay, say you uh, shoot 30 weddings at 
$4,000 a piece. You know, that's $120,000 for the whole year. And then just kind of keep track of your expenses from the past year. And then you can kind of break down saying, okay, wow, like I, you know, I spent 20 or $30,000 um, on expenses this year. And then break down like, okay, how much I owed in taxes. Right. And then you can kind of gauge on how much you need to be charging or how many weddings you want to be shooting per year so that you're not like living off of $20,000, you know? Um, I think everyone hits a point where they're, they get burned out because they just keep saying yes, you know, yes, yes, yes to all of these things. And I think to me, when you kind of know you made it is when you can start to say no, because you know, you can get a bigger paycheck in something else. Um, gotcha. and you doing less work. And so that's kind of how I started to break it down. Um, of saying, and me again, I, I'm in this weird kind of awkward position of where my clients are still like on a lower budget, but I want to say yes to them because that's the nice side of me. But I also know that like my quality, what I can produce, how long I've been doing it, um, that I should be charging, you know, X amount of money. Um, and then, I, you know, next year, like I, I kind of said, I want to be shooting around 35 weddings next year. Um, that's kind of my end year goal. Uh, okay. And so, you know, and again, right now it's a weird lull with COVID and everything. So like booking and shooting and kind of, and that's another thing you want to be keeping track of like how, how much you have booked for next year per month, you know? So like not at the end of the year, you realize that you're 15 short. So that's when you start to really push for advertising and sponsoring uh, your business so that you can get those other 15 weddings, you know, and whatnot. So how far in advance do you, are people looking to book with you? So, um, it depends. Um, I've noticed, I would say between six months, six months to about a year and a half, um, which is a very wide range. Uh, yeah. But I had someone book me, you know, back in 2000, early 2019 for t like end of 2020, you know? So okay. it's like, it, it's weird. It just depends on the couple. Um, some couples just want to have a really short engagement. I think it just truly depends on their age um, because some older couples are like, All right, we're ready just to get married, you know, within right. five months. And mm -hmm. some of the younger couples who are still in college, who have to graduate, who have other things on their mind are like, okay, let's put it off for a year. Um, you know, and that's just kind of how, you know, life falls. Yeah. Those long mm -hmm. engagements are rough. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so Matt, but, do you consider yourself a, like pretty much a strictly a wedding photographer or do you, do you still shoot other events? I, so I would strictly call myself more a wedding photographer um because my main thing is weddings uh you know that's where that's where the money's at i would love to make a full-time gig off of senior portraits but you know they're they're only a certain amount of time of the year um mm -hmm. they're a smaller season um you know they don't make as much money you'd have to sh be shooting a, a lot more um and your evenings would be shot uh so i would call myself a wedding photographer um, okay. just because that's the kind of my main thing I do shoot random, you know, I do have packages for events. Like I just shot a graduation. Um, and so, uh, you know, I do an hourly rate for that. Um, but it was my old high school and I had a lot of friends that are graduating. So I decided to do that. But you know, that's again, that's where I say like you get to a point in your photography business where you focus kind of on one thing and you focus on that really hard. Um, in the very beginning, you're just saying yes to everything because you want to get exposure out there. You want to get your name out there. You want to get your photos out there. But kind of once you get, you know, later on into your career, you're going to start to realize you want to really want to focus on one thing um, and just do really well at that. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. but, so, yeah. I mean, it's, I guess, like in different photography areas, like when I, I don't know, I guess I was just, I was reading something the other day about a National Geographic photographer. Like how much... Mm -hmm. How much is that guy getting paid to like go with National Geographic, go take pictures in all these different places? Like, is he just, oh. how was he lucky enough to get that position? I guess, you know, like, I feel like that's I, a pretty sweet gig. I have no idea. I would like, um, I don't know, because I think, you know, 
I literally just looked it up on my computer really quick for how much a National Geographic salary for a photographer costs. And it says 42000 per year, which wow, I think is awful. kind of low. It's for, awful. But well, I think it's everybody wants it. Everybody wants to travel around the yeah. world taking pictures of the frogs. And so you don't have to pay that much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think – and maybe – I don't know how National Geographic runs – um, if they have like technically employees or if they ha- like buy photos from photographers. Oh, if they buy photos from people? Yeah. Hmm. Like people who live in South Africa, people who live, which no one really lives in Antarctica, but you know, like people who live in these different parts of the world who just shoot really good photos kind of as a hobby, um, you know, and then sell it to National Geographic magazines. Okay. Um and so I, I don't know necessarily how they would get into that, what they had to do. Um, I never went – I'm sure you could probably go to school for photography and then well, somehow get an I internship. Mean, yeah. That was my next question is like is there – I mean is there a schooling for photography? Like do people there is, go to school for photography? <laughs> yeah, so there is. And if anyone's listening who is going to school – Go you. Um, just save your money and don't get too much in debt. Um, Sounds like I, you really endorse that, Matt. Yeah. No, 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 it's not necessarily, you know, if you feel called to it and you have the money, I wouldn't advise it. But I would just say make sure you don't go too heavily into debt. But there is schools that are like, here is, um, you know, here is a photography school for you. And I don't know necessarily what they teach you. I truly don't. I think they teach you the history. They teach you very the technical side of it. Um, again, I don't know, you know, but I also market myself as a natural light photographer. I don't do anything with um, studios. I don't do anything type like that. So like, I'm not a huge expert on like, if you had me go and take photos of a car in a parking lot with like, stand up lights like i don't know how to really do that um and they might teach you how to you know use light stands or teach you how to do this and that like that a little more technical and like might be more commercial type use um but they teach you they teach you how to shoot photos but not how to run a business that's what i've overall heard from people um and i've met amazing photographers who don't know how to run a business and that kills them gotcha yeah you I can totally tell you have a you have an entrepreneur's mind. You 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 quickly found mentors and stuff that could help you grow your business, not just your photography skills. Yeah, and and uh, I would just say like, you know, if I put a percentage of like how much it would be to like shooting photos to running a business, I would say like forty, sixty, forty percent you're shooting photos, and sixty percent you're like really just behind the computer understanding how to run a business, keeping track of your mileage, uh, money, understanding expenses, how taxes work, you know, kind of setting a business plan for yourself and goals. So you're not just making money, not knowing what to do with it or where to go or, you know, um, I don't know. I've just, again, like I've met so many creative people that just don't understand how to run a business and like that really kills them and they could be making buku bucks, but they just don't know where to start or what to do. So, Matt, how do you feel about all those people who go to school for business degrees? So, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, so, again, I don't want to offend anyone who's listened to this. I truly – and I've had friends who go to business school, and, I, and you know, in, in, if you're looking more for um, – what do you call it? Like climbing the ladder, uh, like being a CEO of a large – corporate yeah. company then like i understand you have to get your was it masters in business no yeah your mba mba yeah and i understand that you have to get your mba in that but if you have a passion to start your own business or work for a small company or um i would highly highly advise you to honestly like just reach out to a bunch of different businesses that you're like oh i could see one day me working or running or helping out with that and just talking to them because uh, for a little bit of a period of time in my life, I was like, oh, I would love to go open up a coffee shop. But I started to kind of talk to these two coffee shop owners and I realized that is not something I want to do. Um, 
because there's just a lot more nitty gritty that I did not realize in the behind the scenes of it that like running a coffee shop is very pretty on the outside, but on the guts of it, there's so much like hands-on work um, that you have to do. And so I, you know, I tell anyone who's going, thinking about business school, um, understand where you kind of want to go with it. If you want to be more corporate, like I have my two friends who they're working for a Hershey company um, and they kind of needed to get their MBA. So like, because the business, you know, needed kind of liability and like kind of know that you went to a school and you kind of know what you're doing in this corporate like business. Um, but again, if you're like looking to open a coffee shop, if you're looking to start a clothing business, if you're looking to do this and that, like just go out and like reach out to small business owners and say, Hey, what did you do? How would you do it differently? Um, and then work your butt off, you know, at a eight to five job, you know, in a warehouse until you can get to that point where it can become more of a full-time or a part-time where you're kind of having two different incomes and you'll have that like weird part where you're still, for me, I didn't go full-time until this year. Um, and I'm in my fourth wedding season. I was always in school. I was always working another job, um, you know, just in case something happened. Um, right. right. In case COVID and then hit. You, yeah, yeah. And then you kind of, <laughs> you kind of like take that leap of faith a little bit. Um, and it's, it's a little bit scary, you know, especially if you have debt or if you're living on your own and you have no help. Um, but you'll get to a point where it's like you either have to take a risk and invest into your business yourself and then it becomes even more real because that's your only income or you still have to try to hold on to a part time job and running your business. And the worst thing you want to do as a self-employed person is burnout, um, you know, yeah, and just sense. learning. Um, and that's kind of what I would say to anyone who's thinking about going to business school, kind of know what you want to get into. And by knowing that means you have to kind of go out and do your own research, reach out to people, go work what you think you would want to do as an intern, as an employee, um, you know, talk to that owner, talk to that boss. Uh, but I, I don't know. I just look at how much tuition costs compared to. <laughs> Uh, uh, Matt, okay, let's, Matt let's... you're talking to two people who fully understand how much tuition oh, costs. It's, <laughs> it's you know 100%. like so I went to story about me. I went to Liberty for uh, a semester, and <laughs> I pretty much kind of figured out I'm paying about ninety eight dollars a day to be at Liberty. Oh yeah, <laughs> and, I, oh yeah, yeah. I, mean, I hundreds of like a hundred dollars per class. Or like I think I think I figured it out at Laterno, yeah, and we, we discounted scholarships. <laughs> It was like sure. fifty dollars every class period, every hour of yeah. class you sat. And so like Jake and I yeah. skipped class all the time because it sucked. And it was like, wow, I just like I just spent fifty dollars and have nothing, nothing to show for it. Yeah, yeah but I mean, and- we also we also looked at it like, oh, this guy, we're paying fifty bucks for this. If we don't feel like we're getting anything out of it, then we're not going to go to class. And a lot awesome. of people made fun of Cole and I for thinking that way, but we were like, well, we're sitting there wasting our time and our money versus just wasting our money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, sure, yeah. And like, it's just it's just tough. I think the other thing I'd say for any business major uh, or business or whatever is like, look at your time and energy. If you think that is worth it, you know, set aside the money. I get the money part. You know, maybe your parents are paying for it. Maybe you have an amazing bomb scholarship. But like, think about, the time and energy that you're putting into it, is that reaping uh, what you want to sow four years later from what you're, you know, because essentially you're delaying what you could be doing for four years. Um, exactly. And so, and so like, yeah. if it, I get it. Like if you're going to be a doctor, if you need a certification, if you're being a teacher or a judge or a lawyer, please, but please go to school. I don't want someone who's like, Oh, I did a two year program and I'm certified to work, you know, be your healthcare worker. No, I, you know, obviously that's very different. Um, but you know, if, if it's something that you don't need to go to college, explore that, um, because you're going to save money, you're going to save time, you're saving energy, and then you're going to be, you know, four steps, three steps in front of that person who did go to college, who's in debt, who put all that time and energy into something that they, you know, like you guys were saying that you didn't necessarily be like, Oh wow, this is worth it to me because some classes aren't, worth it you know like your gen eds or some like entry-level classes literally you're like why am i paying x amount of money to be here 
or why do I, why, why am I required? Um, I remember the funny story thinking about this now in high school, uh, I dropped out of Spanish three. Um, and, the the person was like, Oh, can you tell me a good reason why you want to drop out of Spanish three? And I said, well, instead of doing Spanish three, I'd rather run my photography business and edit photos and send them back to my client and make money than sit into Spanish three, because I have really no use to do Spanish three. And he was like, yeah. all right, fair enough. And so like, I got a study hall. And so I got all my homework done beforehand. And then I would just edit photos for an hour that I would have to do and then send to my clients. So I could be, you know, a, a step up um, on just work. So I don't have as much after school. Exactly. Matt, you are, yeah. you're really preaching here. Cole and I Preach, often felt the choir, yeah. in school that <laughs> there was a lot of time and money wasted on classes that we didn't need to take because they didn't relate sure. anywhere close to our degree. But, you know, that's think, a yeah. s- side topic, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I, I got I to gotta preach a little on that. Uh, <laughs> I, like, I think it is, it's so frustrating because even some of the classes I think I needed – I've still learned mm-hmm. way more in my job. Like I haven't like thermodynamics. I work at a power plant. All that that is yeah. is thermodynamics. I don't remember a thing from college. I, I've just learned on the fly. Yeah. And so it, in a career like photography, I, I totally agree with your your kind of business model of learning on the fly while you're making money. You might be making less, but you're not paying. And so why would you go to school to learn yeah. on the fly anyway? Like it, it, it just doesn't make any sense for so and, many You know, people. and it <sighs> – I also think, you know, like if school wasn't, and it's not an easy, it, you know, I'm not preaching like, oh, here's the solution. Don't go to college. You know, it's just it's <laughs> interesting to see the, the collegiate level of just like academics and what they think is necessary for your degree. Um, and I don't know where, like where or why people like say, oh, you need to take this gen ed or this class and this class um, to get your degree. Um, it's cause they want money <laughs> and you know, and like it probably it might be that, you know, it might be because literally my first semester at Liberty was just all these gen eds. And I was just like, what am I doing here? Why am I paying X amount of money? Like I'd rather just skip the first semester or even skip the first whole year and then finally dive into what I want to be doing. Um, and so I don't know. Yeah. Matt, you sh- I a hundred percent agree with you. <laughs> it's just school. School is weird. I, uh, and school is not for everyone. It's not that I had bad grades either. I, you know, people, whenever they ask me like, Oh, why'd you drop out? They always expect me to be like, Oh, I, I had bad grades or like the money, but it was just me being like, I value my time and energy into it and being like, yeah, this isn't, this isn't it. This, there's gotta be something better. Um, yeah. and so that's kind of what I did and why I did what I did. So, gotcha. yeah. I mean, I mean that that's to me the smartest decision. Looking at your time, energy to see, you know, is it worth it? Is this risk versus reward worth it? And then sometimes it's yeah. not worth it, and you just you decide, all right, I'm not doing it. And I think that's a super smart decision. There's no point in sticking in something, wasting time and money, and like in the end, be like, well, this wasn't worth it, you know? Um, yeah. Especially when the getting's good. I mean. Like like you're saying, photography's pretty hot business right now. I think Instagram has, yeah. has definitely helped that. But if you're gonna waste these four years in school and then you don't know what the market's gonna be like in four years, nobody really does. And you can come yeah. out of school and not even be able to do photography. Whereas school's pretty much always gonna be there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Yeah. I mean, speaking of the market, Matt, that's kinda of something I wanted to bring up. So like in Lancaster County area, you know, Lancaster County's mm-hmm. for those who don't know, very pretty area, a lot of old historic like farmland and farm buildings. Yeah. And so I feel like that makes it a pretty good area for photography. Oh yeah. And I I guess yeah. I wanted to get your thoughts on like someone like just growing up wherever, do you think they could make a photography business work anywhere or do you feel like it has to you have to have kind of a good location and yeah because also oh, also man. feel like there's a pretty good kind of young um growing client or there's a lot of i don't know how to say this a lot of people who get married in the lancaster county area yeah oh no, yeah there <laughs> is um yeah and i guess that's that's a good good question um i've you know i feel like there i also don't pay attention a lot to other lancaster county photographers so i wouldn't i I don't know a whole bunch i just know who are good friends of mine who aren't cutthroat and who aren't mean and so uh gotcha (laughs) 
<laughs> but like they have a, you know, they have an ample amount of clients, you know, they, I would say 30 to 40, about the same as me, you know? And so to for, answer your first question, the clientele here is amazing. You have so many people, which is funny coming here for destination weddings from like Philly, from Maryland, from New Jersey, from yeah, Delaware, really coming to Lancaster to for like <laughs> barn weddings, which you're like, why are you coming here? Um, you know, and, and apparently like we, I, you literally, there are an amazing, amazing amount of wedding of venues around this area. And it just yep. makes sense because there's so many people getting married. And so, yeah, I stepped into a very, like very, uh, a well flourishing, um, clientele business market uh but you know if that's the thing like i don't really want to move away anywhere because i don't want to restart all of that and i don't know what you know other places are looking like like you know if i was to try to go restart in pensacola florida or um you know birmingham alabama like i don't know what the market looks like how many people are getting married but right. what i do know is in this area it's so like it's such a heavy market that I'm, you know, you get clients no matter what. Um, and so like, I don't know, like if I was to transition, um, I'm sure it would take me like two years to get back where I was here. Um, I That's guess for the I... person who go ahead, sorry. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. Cause I, I mean, I was thinking about like where I grew up in, <laughs> you know, broken bow, Oklahoma, like there's, mm -hmm. there's not, you're not having too many outdoor weddings just because it's so darn hot. And yeah. Like, yeah. And, and then even wedding venues in like Oklahoma, it's like, all right, you're going to, you're going to a church and that church might not even be that pretty. Yeah. And, and that's where, um, you know, if, if you're someone who's starting to look into getting into photography or any type of business, like I said, know your market. And so like any type of business, you want to get to know your market and your competition. And so like, if you were to look up like Oklahoma, wherever you live, Jake, like wedding photographers, you know, how many search results are you going to get? 10, 15, 20. If you looked up Lancaster County, wedding photographers, you're going to get like 500. There are so many wedding photographers here. Um, and that's just a sign that like business is really well there. Um, it might be con uh, uh, saturated, but like, you know, that's where you kind of have to know. Uh, I would come at, if I was to go move locations, start something new, I would start it just as exactly how I started it when I first started. Find the prettiest couples, get connections, shoot in really pretty places, and just post about it. Tag, make sure those people are tagging you. Um, get connected in like communities, get connected at church. Um, because church also is a great place where there are so many people getting, young people getting married. Um, right. Which again, sounds kind of like behind people's back, but like, it's true, you know, like, <laughs> well, I mean, that's what I was saying about the Lancaster County area. You're in a, you're yeah, in a, a yeah. bubble of, um, like, I don't know, like, marriage, marriage oh, Christian. <laughs> yeah. It's like a yeah. Christian subculture almost. Yeah. Yeah. And like, and that's the thing, like I would say 70% of my weddings are almost all Christian weddings, you yeah. know? And so, that's where you can kind of tell for the short engagements are usually Christians <laughs> and the long engagements are usually secular weddings, which is very funny to me. Um, Matt, what are you know, implying? I'm not saying anything, <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah, just like, it's just, I don't know. You, you Like I said, you want to go into it having a game plan um, and just being like, all right, this is how I'm going to try to tackle and get these clients and you might have to start back with shooting everything you possibly can getting your name out there if you're shooting for a coffee shop if you're shooting for a church if you're shooting for a clothing brand that's what you got to do to get your name out there and then you can slowly transition back into your wedding photography then you can slowly transition into back whatever you're doing doing um gotcha that makes yeah. sense mm -hmm. you know and that's obviously not a universal thing um but that's really just any freelancer uh but that's kind of what I would say to your uh, question. Yeah. The the other thing I was kind of thinking about, like, so over this time, you know, as as you started with your, your mm -hmm. like, kind of iPhone basic camera setup, like, I, because when I, I've gone online, looked at some camera stuff, and you can buy some mm -hmm. really expensive equipment. 
Like oh, so yeah, that, yeah. that really expensive equipment, are you getting like that much more value out of it? Like is it is it is that equipment worth what they're saying it's worth? I've I've, I've always um, just wanted to know like yeah, camera yeah. quality versus picture quality. So I think there are um market standards that everyone should have. Okay. Um I think there's somewhat of like you want a good high resolution camera. You know, and I only, you know, I started out with literally just two lenses. Um, and they were not the top of the line lenses, but medium range lenses, but they shot amazing, you know. And so, like, I think uh, any photographers or really any business owner's first inclination when they start to see money coming in is to buy the absolute best. Mm -hmm. um, and mine is trying to, like, be very frugal, which sometimes, yeah, I'll buy, like, a really nice thing but I know I'll make the money back. Um, but like to only buy what you need um, and do your research of understanding why this works this way or why does that. And so like there are definitely market standards that like, okay, you should have this, you should have that. Um, but the differences of the quality, you know, shooting, if you were to buy a, uh, example, like if you were to buy a thousand dollar camera versus a twenty five hundred dollar camera, mm -hmm. um, there won't be on the client end. There won't be huge visible differences. Okay. Um, but on the photographer's end, for the um, well, not the accessibility, but just like the user friendliness, the amount of options, what you can or can't do with it will be much more so that you can produce a, a faster or a better looking photo in the sense of like on your end. And this will, as in like most people's eyes can't tell a difference between like an 18 megapixel photo and a 24 megapixel. Okay. Like most people can't tell the difference. Um, you know, I would say the standard is like a full frame. I would say the standard is, um, shooting high resolution. And when it comes to your lens, um, really you're paying for the glass in it um, because different glass reacts differently to different things. And that sounds really confusing. Mm -hmm. And again, to the technical part of it is like a Canon um, brand lens. Look, uh, when the light comes into it is a little different than what I own is a Sigma. And so that what at the end of the day, what really matters is how you edit and what you want to do in post and post. Okay. I mean like the post editing. Yep. Um, and so like, again, it's not so much, you know, your quality, but it's just how that light works with that lens. Um, and again, I would say it's a lot more te technical on the photographer's end of what they want to get to and what they want to do. Um, you know, buying a $4,500 camera that has a high speed frame rate, to be able to shoot a, a bird flying in the air, to be able to shoot a sports moment is 100% worth it to buy that camera over a camera that isn't as fast and can only shoot, you know, a lower end frame rate, uh, but is meant more for like video, you know? And so like, that's just more the technical differences of those two. Um, does that kind of answer your question? No, yeah, yeah, that totally makes sense. I was just, it's, it's, I was just wondering at like, at what point, I guess, is there like a breaking point where it's like, ah, well, you know, we're, I mean, I could spend 3000 and basically sure. get the same thing as, you know, sure, for, yeah. you know, and that's where <sighs> it comes down to preferences. Um, I think, uh, you know, like I was saying that Canon, so the Canon lens for a 35 goes for, I think $1,800. The lens that I bought goes mm -hmm. for 900. So it's literally half the price. And essentially does the same thing. But gotcha. some people are like, oh, no, I only buy Canon because of this. Like because of – and it's really just a biased opinion um, that is like, you know, they both really do the same exact thing. There might be minor differences. But like, so is that like on a, the client is, end – Is there a name God. brand like argument to it? Like, oh, I'm a Canon photographer or I'm a – I don't even know, like another – like Sigma photographer? Sony, I don't know. Or, yeah, yeah and, I mean – and, and and I would say, you know, it's not so much a brand. They all do different things well. Canon, okay. I think, does a great job with understanding the settings very well, understanding, and they do a really good job with skin tones. 
And that's really important to me for wedding photography because you want your subject to be like what they naturally are. Um, right. Nikon, again, across the board, if you do your enough research, buying, buying this type of Nikon, buying this type of Sony, buying this type of Canon, they essentially all do the same thing. There just might be little tweaks here and there. Like Canon does a really good job with skin tones. Nikon does really good with uh, shutter speed and having a really crisp, clear photo. Uh, Sony is really good for a hybrid of photo and video. Um, you know, and so it's not like one is better than the other. They just all kind of do little different things that the other one can't. And gotcha. that's how they have a niche kind of in the market. Okay. So yeah, that makes sense. I have another equipment question. How yeah, often yeah. are you are you replacing stuff and, and changing changing your setup? You said you're going into your fourth wedding season. Have you bought a new camera yeah. every year? Or no. are you yeah. able to, to keep the same one for, for most of the time? And so that's the beauty with wedding uh, with I guess just photography. Your equipment doesn't really go out of date and it's as long as you keep it uh very well kept, you don't have to replace a lot. You might have to get your image sensor, which is like the camera inside of it, just like calibrated, which is really just cleaning it and making sure it's uh like just well kept and clean. Um so I fourth wedding season I have three different cameras. Um but again, I try to say like Use the equipment that you have to your best ability, but if you truly need it, you have to buy something new. And so I've never bought any type of lens or camera for replacement. I've only added to my collection because I know that I need it. So like I have two cameras for myself and then I give a camera to my second shooter uh, because it's just easier for them if they have their if they have my equipment so they don't have to worry about like bringing their own equipment or if, if they don't have a certain lens that I'm like, oh, we kind of need this for the day. Um, that makes sense. You know, mm -hmm. and so like, Again, lenses last forever. I actually usually buy used lenses because they're very rare times, unless there's cracks, unless there's some type of water moisture inside of them that go bad. Like they do a very good job of just holding up for, you know, five to 10 years if you keep them well kept. You know, cameras, mm. they have a shutter life, which um, is like, you know, say it's, 500,000 photos, you know, I put that in air quotes that you could take on it kind of just like running shoes, you know, you have only so many miles that you can shoot on it before you'd either have to replace the sensor or get it like, just clean. And I think they say like, every year, get your sensor calibrated just to make sure it's, you know, up to date and well to do. And so like, hmm. that's the upfront costs for a photography business are just a camera and a lens and maybe an SD card. And so, so yeah. you know, you're you're spending, you could literally get by with spending $1,500 and shooting good photos. And then basically at some point, what you're saying is your, your equipment cost basically goes to nothing, essentially. To absolutely nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then like for your, your, um, editing software, like it's probably a one time yeah. purchase of Photoshop or Lightroom. That's not a I su actually... subscription service, is it? So I do subscription um, okay. because uh, if you do the one-time purchase, you can't upgrade it yearly. So they always come out with new updates, how to fix bugs. And so okay. I do – It's I think it's like 25 a month, um, which again, 25 a month is really not that much. <laughs> yeah, it's um, not that bad. As in Sounds like, like a lot you to could, me. <laughs> yeah, as but... in like, you know, you could you could pretty much in one wedding say, you know, I, I think I forget what I figured out for the expense-wise – in one wedding sitting, you could pay off your whole yearly subscriptions, as in that involves your editing mm. software, how you share your photos, and also, um, you know, your, uh, uh, what is it called, admin, like keeping track of clients, and then, um, right. what's that last one, your accounting software. And essentially, but, yeah. you know, you get to a point where one wedding pays for that for the whole year. And then you start to keep track of stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, and so like, you know, again, I, that's the entrepreneur. That's a business side of me where I fell in love of being like, Oh, I got to keep track of like, okay. So, you know, one wedding will pay for all of this. One wedding will pay for all of that. And now I have, you know, out of the 30 weddings, 25 of them are essentially income, you know, where yeah. like five of them are going towards second shooting equipment, travels, you know, whatnot. Minus that, so, them darn taxes. That would get you. Well, I mean, Cole, taxes, you know what they say so. about like, you know, for working people, your first 
three months are going to taxes or whatever, all those paychecks. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I look at yeah. I look at Uncle Sam's portion, and sometimes I think it's bigger than mine. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, Matt, oh, you go ahead, no, Matt. I, no, 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 no. I was just saying something about taxes, but it's, it's not relevant. I, I was just gonna the <laughs> other the other kind of business thing I wanted to know about was like sure. when you're when you're working with this couple who's like, hey, we want to hire you to be our photographer. Uh-huh. What does your uh-huh. your contract look like? So my contract. Um, essentially really protects me. So I have contracts for my wedding clients. I don't really have contracts for family uh, photo shoots, you know, photo shoots, because usually they're super low key enough that it's like, not like I don't have to worry about somehow them trying to do a lawsuit on me um, right. or complaining, you know, 99% of the time there's no problems. My contract protects me. Um, I have their costs and fees, uh, time and payment. And so that says, okay, so you sign for this amount of time and you're going to pay me for this much. Um, and the, your, the date of your wedding is this, and it's going to be at this place. So it's all these guarantees. Um, the other thing it talks about is like meals. It talks about copyright ownership. So like, and, and photography is a weird, uh, place right now. And I think you're going to see more and more of a trend of intellectual property where it's weird because it's not a physical, thing that you can buy um you know what i'm saying like it's a digital like you buy it digitally if you think about it that way because yeah, obviously no, yeah, you can print out the man. photos um and so like i had to kind of put in a place in my uh you know contract you know uh, uh defining it as intellectual property um and then uh guarding myself against artistic release so if a you know a client comes and say hey we hired you, but you didn't edit this photo how we wanted to, could you do it this way? Essentially, I can just say, hey, like you, you hired me for my own uh, style. So like, technically, I don't have to do anything to like, accom- accommodate them. But obviously, the, you know, client knows best. So like, I will go in and try to do my best. But again, you know, if someone's like, we wanted you to edit this way, uh, and you edit it very differently than we requested, like, I would be like, well, you know, this is, this is like my artistic, you know, uh, take on it. Um, I also put it like liability as in like damages, loss of products, um, archiving, you know, I say I keep it in the cloud for 12 months after that, I put it onto an external hard drive. So if they want to, they have to email me saying, uh, you asking for the photos again. Um, cancellation, rescheduling that has saved my butt this year because of COVID. Um, you know, so, 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 yeah, so like if a client cancels, I have no obligation to reschedule or to repay them anything. They do read they this do whole thing. all up front? So do I do pay a 30%? Percent? No, so I do a 30% down payment um and that's pretty much hold the date and then hire a second shooter. Okay. Um whatever the 30% of that package is and then the 70% is due within a month before uh the wedding. And so um again I've had this kind of problem uh, for this COVID thing where these people are saying, oh, you know, we decided to cut down our wedding to a small intimate ceremony and it's only four hours. We hired you for originally eight hours. Can you cut off 50%? And in my contract, again, I have no legal obligation to say, oh, you know, like I'll give you 50% off. Um, So what I do is I usually say, oh, you know, because I don't want to be a total jerk. Uh, I always say like, I I can't do 50% off, but what I can do is this. Um, right. and again, that's what contracts are made for, you know, it, and it sets a weird precedent to say, say you, say you do bend the rules and you cut 50% off. Um, then they're going to tell their friends and say, Oh, our photographer cut it 50% off. So he doesn't hold to his contracts, you know? And so like, it just sets a very interesting precedent for your business. And I, you know, for me, I'm trying to hold on to just like, Hey, we had a contract. You knew the risks. I can't really do anything else, you know, uh, uh, out of my control because, you know, that's what, that's what contracts are made for. Yeah. That completely makes sense. So when you, I guess when you got started, did you like hire a lawyer for a contract help writing a contract or like, how did you, so that's a one up yourself or no, I actually, you can buy them online. You'll be very surprised how much you can buy online and they're legally binding contracts. As long as you change like your, your, like, you know, it will say, uh, 
said vendor, which would be me, you just right. change it to, you know, uh, Matt Kirk Photography. Because, you know, again, uh, you have to, to buy these, you have to have an LLC. To buy yep. these, you have to have an insurance. So I have all those things. Again, my insurance for my company, you know, I don't pay a lot, but it covers me for X amount of money, which really covers any type of damages, any type of injuries that happen to a client. I have set amount that, you know, um, right. is covered. So like all of these things, um, these contracts are meant so that if someone does want to sue me, protects me. And then if they do sue me, they sue Matt Clark Photography, not my own personal self. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but yeah, does that kind of make sense? Again, this is no, where yeah, that's, like, that's definitely just, I wanted to know basically how you, you came up with your contract, sure. everything that was included. And I didn't know yeah. if it like also said you have 30 days to give them their photos after the wedding. Oh, I, no, I, yeah, I do have a, um, it says a uh, return uh, time. And so I put in the contract four to six weeks which is like, okay. wow, that's like a long time, which is like over a month. I say that I always, my rule of thumb is always, um, what is it? Under, what is that? Yeah, Under you don't, you don't I wanna, always yeah. say something. I forget what it is. Anyways, you overestimate your time that's going to take you, right? I, yeah, I always say something and then over deliver. I forget how that saying goes. But anyways, <laughs> it, it, it's just something pretty much like where you just want to like not sm speak more than what you can actually do. So under so uh, over deliver. Yeah, that's it, man. I cannot think of that. Um, and so that's kind of like what I do, uh, you know, right now with, with all these weddings and COVID and I went more full time. So I'm not working on a coffee shop anymore. I've been right. delivering, you know, weddings, uh, you know, within two to three days. Um, oh wow! Yeah, <laughs> so you should, get a, you should get a bonus for that. Yeah, and that, yeah. <laughs> but you know, again, like this weekend, I have three weddings, so it's gonna be closer to a month before I get some of these photos back. You know, and, yeah, and I see what you're saying. I, my my goal is like you know three weddings, and then I have next weekend I have um, what is it? Three weddings, and then next week I only have one wedding. So like, just trying to stay on top of things is really important because like. You don't want to be caught four weddings behind because that's just terrible, you know? Right. Yeah, that would be some long mm -hmm. days editing yeah. 6,000 photos. <laughs> yeah, oh. and it's just like – and I, you do it – you kind of do it in waves. You know, you kind of say, okay, I'm going to call through all these photos today. All these weddings I'm going to go – you know, you do them in kind of phases. You know, all today I'm just going to go through all the photos and pick out the best ones. Tomorrow I'm going to edit – uh, for three hours, take a break, edit for three hours. And whenever I get done in those three hours, I, you know, being any type of self-employed becomes really weird because you work from home. And I truly believe like psychologically, like working from home is the weirdest thing because it's also a place of rest. It's also a place where like you go not to do work, but then your home is your work. So like you feel really guilty when you're just sitting down relaxing that you should be doing something with your business because there's always something to be doing. And mm -hmm. so that's a whole nother spiel I could get on about balance and rest. Um, I mean, Cole, because, talk, you know, Cole used to say that a lot uh, about when we were in college, you, you stand on the desk to get into your bed, to go to sleep, yeah. to step on your desk where you do all your homework in college. Yeah. And like, as in like when I was at college for a little bit of semester, I, uh, <laughs> I, I rarely ever did my homework in my dorm room. I always went to the library. I always went somewhere else mm -hmm. because I didn't want to mesh those two together. Um, because I would always feel like I had to be doing something, uh, because it would always mess with me. And I don't know why, but that's just kind of how I was wired that like, if there's something that needs to be done, I can't not just not do it. Mm -hmm. And so like, you know, I, I once heard balance is a moving target. So one day, one week could always look very differently from the next week. Um, and so, yeah, yeah it's very that's kind of my sp spiel about that. Again, I could go another hour on just talking about that. But <laughs> <laughs> um, the only other question I had regarding contract wise, does mm -hmm. it like do they call out? Like, hey, you have to have like a ring shot. You have to have this shot. You have to have this shot. Or is that something um, you kind of sit down and talk with them beforehand? I, I uh, so what I do is uh, 
Oh man, these are just so many great little bits and pieces for any photographer out there. So there's this thing called HoneyBook, <laughs> um, which is like an admin. So essentially I have 30 emails that I have already wrote out that are very generalized that can automate and send to everyone. And so in one of those, and that's, you know, it's like 90 days before, 40 days before the wedding. So it's like really nice because then it'll say how to get a shot list. And so that's what I was going to get to a shot list. Uh, they create a shot list for me. I request one. And so that's pretty much kind of a little bit of insurance that like, if, if you didn't really put it in your shot list, I have no responsibility or you don't have anything to hold over my head because I didn't get that, gotcha. you know? And so like I say, okay, I, you know, again, I have set shots that I know I'm always going to get, you know, I have, I have so many poses and whatnot to get, but with, you know, save family photos which are a little more unique because like everyone's kind of different. Oh, we want family photos with this grandma and that grandma, but not that grandpa and that, you know, it's so like, yeah, it's very Uncle difficult. Larry. Yeah. yeah it's like we want Larry. this, we want, uncle. we don't want uncle Larry, but we want uncle Andrew, you know, like it's always something different. And so, um, that's where I would say that's a little more with, you know, in air quotes again, a uh, liable thing for me. Um, but again, they, you know, they know what I can do and they know the shots that I already can get. Uh, Cause I guess, you know, fourth season wedding photography, you know, the shots that people want um, and people, yeah. what they yeah. don't want. And so just keeps people from yeah. saying the only shot I wanted was this and you didn't do it. Yeah. Like, no, yeah. you yeah. should have told me to do it. Yeah. And that, you know, I, that's why I shoot an email saying, Hey, these are like, and if they're unique shots, you know, like, um, Oh, I want a shot with my mother's veil on me or my mother putting the veil on me like how am i supposed to know that's your mother's veil and it's very precious to you unless you let me know you know so stuff like that where i'm like okay you know keeps keeps them a little more responsible and accountable for that and then me a little more accountable to it hmm. but yeah so oh, yeah, i mean i think that's that's very smart that's yeah because that's what I was i was kind of wondering because i i felt like i could see some angry bride coming back and being like you didn't get the picture of us yeah crossing arms and shoving cake yeah. down each other's faces yeah mm -hmm. yeah and and again most of my wedding clients are amazing uh i'm not gonna say <laughs> yeah i'm not gonna say Just, who it is i'm not gonna say but... who but no there have been one or two that i'm like oh man those were rough wedding clients for me to deal with um okay. But again, nine, <laughs> it's one of those days where you're just like, man, this is a job, you know, and it's true. Like I, I always hate, um, the, you know, the saying like, Oh, do what you feel passionate and love because there will be truly days where this is just work to you. Um, you know, and like, hey, I think, I mean, I think that's, a, I guess a good point to hear. Like some, I hear that a lot as well. Like, Oh, tra ch chase your passion and well, uh -huh. sometimes... never work a day in your life bull crap yeah there's you have to work the certain days in your life there's certain days yeah. where you have to go to work and like it's just yeah and that's just like one of those deals you know people i think are looking and i say this in a very generalized statement but they're just looking for this like dream job that they'll absolutely love every single day and they'll never complain and they'll love making money and they'll love the work that they do and i'm sure there there could be a job like that out there for you but a job at the end of the day, it's going to be hard work. There's going to be times where you hate it, but also times where you love it. And that's, you know, going back all the way to like saying that time and energy, like, is this worth it to you? You know, like, is your hard work worth it to you? Um, and so that's what, you know, that's what I always yeah. say. I don't know. No, man. I mean, Matt, I feel like you're, you've been really, I mean, I feel like it's been a great interview. You really helped you know, open my eyes to everything, photography, you know, what you're yeah. thinking about when you're running your own business. I think we'll, yeah. we'll mm -hmm. end with our generic, what no one told us question at any okay. point. Did you wish like, Hey man, I wish somebody would have told me this so that oh, I could, man. it would have made my life easier. <laughs> you know, like, Oh, oh my, man. you know, cause I had a lot of those experiences where it was mm -hmm. like in high school. Well, you know, if somebody would have just told me this, it would have made everything so much easier. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh man, that's a. There's like a thousand things that I wish someone would have told me. <laughs> uh, so narrowing it down to like just one, um, I think like, I think the thing that I wish someone would have told me sooner with running your own business, being a young person, is 
letting your yes be yes and your no be no. I think I, and that just also involves in my life um, because you get to a point where you just keep saying yes, yes, yes to everything because you want to be available. You want to get your name out there. You want to be working on your business. You want to be uh, uh, doing it. But again, like I go back to like when you think you kind of made it a little more and it's become a little more steady, like that's when like saying no is okay. Saying no for the sake of just taking rest for yourself. Um, I don't think people in our generation know the word burnout. Um, and that can really destroy your life and just learning that like the Lord created the seventh day to rest. He wanted you to rest. Um, but he also neutrally didn't want you to work. And so like, I wish that I would learn to say no more and stick with it. Um, you know, I think that's kind of what I wish I learned earlier on in my business, but you know, you learn from a lot of stressful nights and a lot of lost sleep because you said yes to too many things. And, uh, Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's what I I wish I kind of learned. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you don't know what you don't know. And that's kind of the, I guess the point of this podcast, we wanted Cole and I wanted to help people hear different options that they have. Sure. It's not, you don't, you don't have to take the normal, High school, college, pick a job, yeah. eight to five. Yeah. There, are, there are other options out there. For sure. Yeah. Cole, and, I mean, is there anything else you wanted to add? No, I uh, really appreciate you coming on, Matt. And uh, of course, insights, yeah, thanks for having me. Your insights into business were really cool to hear. I, I have dreams of starting starting my own company, and to to hear somebody yeah. so young that's done it, kind of in our generation, is really cool. So I appreciate your insights yeah. and being willing to share, man. Yeah, and that's that good. Like you talk, just saying the word like dreams. I just truly don't think that people dream enough about their life. Like saying like I want to do this, and then understanding the steps to go get it. You know, and I, that makes me really sad because there are so many people with great potential, and they just kind of not throw it away, but just go to college and do the normal life. And I'm like, you could have such an amazing life and feel more fulfilled for what you do and your time and energy, but. They just kind of sit back and go back to normal life. Um, and that's scary, but you know, yeah, that's that's but for another podcast. <laughs> that's a that's a whole another podcast. We can we can talk. Yeah, but anyway, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks thanks for coming on, Matt.